Have you ever looked up what your recycling company actually recycles? Do you sometimes wonder if it's worth it putting in the work to separate your trash? I'm Kata Loden, grab a cup of coffee and let's talk about it. This video consists of two parts, understanding where we're at in terms of recycling and taking action. So looking at what we can and should do. If you want to learn more about technology and climate impact, please subscribe below and let's get started. My husband says recycling is a lie we tell ourselves and if you look into it, he's not the only one. In fact, our society is very disconnected from the reality of recycling. Wow, okay. Um... What do I do? That's a very good question. Public Works, this is Monica. How can I help you? Are, are Is it out at the curb or is it on... Okay, it's at the curb. Hey, Billy, it's Monica. How are you? The, the resident has been yard waste in the wrong containers. Um, so let me transfer you over there, okay? Hold on a second. Certain items are about an hour, hour, hour and a half ago. Yeah. Outside. This video is not intended to create frustration. However, I think knowing the truth is the way to get the best end result in the long run. We created the South Pacific Garbage Patch, an enormous swirl vortex of marine debris swept up in the ocean currents and collected into a trash mass of one and a half times the size of Texas. The patch was discovered in 2017, 20 years after scientists discovered the Great Pacific Patch. Two swirling masses of debris, three times the size of France. We create 2 billion tons of waste every year and that number is expected to increase 70% by 2050. When you throw away one ton of garbage, 6.2 tons of CO2 equivalent go into the atmosphere in the form of methane. Methane is 86 times more potent than CO2 over a 20-year period. Big waste dominates every aspect of solid waste and recycling practice and policy. The top four consolidated companies earn 30% of the 70% economic sector. Big waste companies own or control 75% of the permitted landfill capacity in metropolitan areas. And they control 50% of the national hauling market. Across most developed nations, landfill still remains the primary means of waste disposal. Many countries are attempting to minimize the amount of waste going into incinerators and landfill sites by developing recycling programs. In OECD countries, at least, their efforts have had varying degrees of success. The world generates 2 billion tons of municipal solid waste annually, with at least 33% of that extremely conservatively not managed in an environmentally safe manner. Worldwide, waste generated per person per day averages 0.74 kg, but ranges widely from 0.11 to 4.54 kg. Though they only account for 16% of the world's population, high-income countries generate about 34% or 683 million tons of the world's waste. Taking a closer look at the US recycling history, we can see a consolidation from the 1960s until today. In the 1950s, 12,000 small independent garbage companies collected waste from commercial accounts. Clever businessmen with access to capital saw an opportunity to form vertically integrated national companies. The consolidation made no sense in terms of efficiency, but market share, political influence and pricing more than made up for administrative inefficiencies. The good news is that recycling rates increased tremendously since the 60s. Grassroots recycling started in the late 1960s. After the first Earth Day in 1970, 2,000 to 3,000 drop-off centers were started throughout the US. Recycling contributes over 100 million tons of raw material to industry and agriculture annually. By 2000, the recycling sector comprised 56,000 companies, tens of thousands of government programs, 1.5 million jobs, and annual sales of 300 billion. Yet today the recycling rate has stagnated. Turning waste into energy has usually meant incineration. But incineration has major environmental drawbacks. Gasification could be an interesting alternative. It's an old technology that's now being repurposed as a cleaner and more economical waste to energy solution. However, just making use of what actually is recyclable would be even better if we cannot avoid creating the waste in the first place. According to the EPA, about 75% of all of the waste in the US is recyclable. 
yet the national recycling rate is 34%. That means that only a third of what we use and throw out every day ends up in the right recycling bin. Recycling rates vary widely by region. For instance, in New York, only 17% of the waste is recycled. You most likely know the recycling symbol, but what you might not know is that the recycling symbol is public domain, however it is not trademarked. The Container Corporation of America originally applied for a trademark on the design, but the application was challenged and the corporation decided to abandon the claim. In the States, for instance, there are several numbers that come with the symbol indicating different types of plastic. The ASTM, the Association for All Sorts of Industry Standards, clearly states that the symbols are not recycled code and the symbol does not imply that the article is recycled. They see the chasing arrows in a number and they're like, oh, obviously this is recyclable, but it isn't. There's all scrambling, all the marketers are scrambling to have their eco cred by having the recycling symbol on their packaging. It's not whether we want to recycle something or not. It's about can we sell it? And who buys what is usually determined by the quality of the plastic. Sitting in the middle of the chasing arrow is a number. If it's a one or a two, it's high value and most likely will be sold on the commodities market. HTPE natural plastic gets sold for $1,000 per ton. But that changed in 2018. For a long time, the US was sending waste to China, including low value waste. But China closed its doors to a lot of the low value plastic waste. This meant that municipal recycling facilities had to spend more time sorting between plastics, pulling out the ones and twos, and paying for the removal of the threes through sevens. But even if it's a one or two, that doesn't mean it's a future sale. If something is so small that it'll fall through the machinery, then it's not gonna end up being recycled. Things like little plastic cups of salsa, a fork or a straw are not gonna make it. So what can and should we do? Unless you work in recycling, this question comes down to how much responsibility we have. The answer to this question depends on the perspective and is of course different from a legal, ethical, political, etc. standpoint. I think most of us would agree that we want a high quality of life for future generations and maintain biodiversity. As citizens, we are all responsible for it. And I think, I think we need to take up the ownership as if this is my home, this is my land, I am going to make it clean. It's not just the state government or the authorities that need to do it. Yeah. It's us who need to do it. So, but apart from cleaning this garbage every time you come here, what do you think are the other measures that you can take? I think two basic things that we can do on individual level is uh, first thing is stop using single-use plastic, which is very important. Second thing is start segregating our waste and recycling it. I think if we start segregating and recycling our waste, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the problem gets solved. Yeah. So we won't have so much plastic on the riverbed and ocean beds, you know. We know that the amount and type of recycling and waste depends on a relationship between demand and supply. Therefore, we know that we as consumers have the power to some extent. Of course, unless you live entirely off grid you need to buy some product off the shelves. So this is where the boundaries of supply come into play. So the rephrased question would be, what can and should we do within the boundaries of supply? I think as consumers, we can easily do two things. First, we can develop a sensitivity towards which products and packaging are worth recycling. And second, we can support companies and startups that produce products and packaging that is biodegradable or zero waste. So that's it for now about understanding and taking action on recycling. Let me know what your thoughts are. If you got value out of this, I'd very much appreciate it if you could subscribe below the video and see you in the next video. Bye.